So we have lots of projects going on. Um, so the Green Chemistry Center, we have about 100 people now, almost 100 people. And we are doing projects working with pharmaceuticals. I mentioned that's a big project working with the pharmaceutical industry. Food waste projects, several of those. Microwave projects, understanding microwave reactors, using biomass feedstocks, scaling up, I'll come back to in a moment, the plant metal capture work I talked about in collaboration with Brazil, looking at various byproducts in Brazil and applications there. Again, more microwave chemistry, more food waste. So lots and lots of projects going on where we are trying with the same philosophy. We want to take something which we now think of as being low value or a waste or even a big problem environmentally and turn that into a resource opportunity. What we're doing is we're doing very, what I think is a very nice model for green chemistry. We're taking new ideas which can come from a student working in the lab to a, a new visiting scientist, and we try and mature them through. So when we think something is really exciting, we are talking to industry about how can we take it forward, and to help prove to the industry we can actually do that on a large scale, we built something called the Biorenewables Development Center. It's a 10 million euro project in collaboration with our friends in plant science, and it takes our best technologies and makes them work at scale. So here's our big microwave. This is a unit about the size of that table, a bit smaller than that, and it processes 30 kilograms per hour of food waste that goes in here and is screw-fed through the microwave chamber and comes out here for separation. So we can show people, yeah, we can take your pea pods and actually put them through here and show you how you can make chemicals from those wastes. Very important. Lots of things going on. So that's the BDC. Our spin-out companies like Starbond, the networking we do. We have a new building which we're moving into next year, which has a lot more opportunity for working with industry. We've just appointed a new full professor in green chemistry to add to the team. So we can carry on doing research, working with industry, Lots of education, of course, like our MSc. So we have a dedicated MSc. We think it was the first MSc in green chemistry in the world. And there are now, we know, at least 20. So it's getting more and more common and more popular. And as I said, we had some Brazilian students working with that course last year. And we have a new network. And this is where we very much hope that uh, through Varnia, this department will become one of the first non-European members. So. This is Europe's main type of networking, the so-called cost mechanism. Cost funds networks in areas Europe believes are really, really important for the future. This network started in March 2013, six months ago. We already have 31 countries, over 100 labs have joined. It's very successful. Hong Kong City is probably going to be is almost complete the uh, bureaucracy, and hopefully we can do the same for here. It is a slow bureaucratic process but it will happen. We're going to make it happen. And then you can integrate with all of these other research groups and companies around Europe and beyond, all interested in taking food supply chain waste and making good things from it. Vanya mentioned that we have a new activity coming up next month. The next month I'm in India. And in India we have our very first meeting of global green chemistry centers, including from Brazil, but also from Korea and Mexico and Europe and USA and Canada and many other places, South Africa now as well. So this is a very exciting opportunity to get people together from all over the world to come together and exchange ideas, learn best practice. So if you don't know York, it's in the middle of uh, England, the UK. Uh, it's a very beautiful city, uh, very, very special. Um, it's got this amazing building we call the Minster, which is our cathedral. So I know your city recently had its birthday yesterday, and it's 100 and whatever it is. York's about 2,000 years old, a bit older. Um, and it started with the Romans. The Romans came to York, and the emperor, Constantine, he actually made his home here. So it became the center of the Roman Empire for two years. And they built walls, and they made York a city. And then later on, the Vikings came from the north of Europe, and they also made it their capital. Later on, kings of England also made it their capital. So it's a very small city, less than half the size of Sao Carlos, but it's full of history. There's an enormous amount of history inside York. So it's very, I do recommend, it's a very beautiful place to visit. We have a lovely building called the King's Manor, which is part of the university, which was started 500 years ago. 
But most of the university is very new, and this is the current main campus, which is where the Green Chemistry Center, you can't see it here, it's in the trees, which is where a green chemistry should be, really. We have a big lake, and this lake is, you can't see them, but this lake has an enormous concentration of ducks and geese and swans. It's a, it's a park, really, which is a, like this is. So it's a very nice environment to work in. And this is most of the green chemistry team, and uh, it's a lovely mix. So there are some Brazilians hiding in here. So uh, ooh, she's Brazilian, and uh, she's Brazilian. In fact, I had uh, lunch with her just the other day in Rio. So she's back in Brazil. And we have a few others hiding, I think, as well, but also people from like Nigeria and from uh, Belgium and from uh, China and from uh, Iraq and from uh, Mexico and from uh, India and from, and a lot from China and China and China and China and China and China and China. And China. We have a lot of Chinese. And just thank you to our sponsors, the many who've done all the good work for us. That's what we do. And if you want to be involved in a very good book series, that's the RSC Green Chemistry Book Series. Thank you very much. So, um, in your opinion, what's the most challenging area in green chemistry when you think about the process? Is it about how to extract or how to get the source from nature? Or is it just about uh, the development of methodolo new methodologies or green methodologies, methodologies that avoid the use of metals or using green solvents or even avoid the use of uh, solvents mm -hmm. or just to manage their waste? Uh, all of them. <laughs> uh, it depends on who you talk, depends on what day it is, who you are talking to. It's a crazy world because Different politi lots of politicians are now getting involved, so it's kind of, you know, you have to tell them a certain... Politicians are not very bright, not very intelligent. You have to talk simple to them, you know? So, uh, what's the biggest challenge? Um, probably, in a big picture sense, the rate of substitution of existing products with green products, because um, the problem is that we have a very complicated industrial infrastructure in the world. You know, the things you buy every day have got really complicated supply chains which go all around the world. And if you try and change that, you're having to make a lot of changes. So um, that's the kind of ultimate big picture challenge. Personally, I think the best people to work with for that are the end users, are the consumer goods companies, because they are the ones who know. Their customers, everybody, want greener, safer things. So they can put pressure on their supply chains to change. Um, so it's happening, but it's the rate of progress I worry about, you know, whether it's quick enough. Um, in terms of, say, the process, you said process, the actual chemical process, what's the biggest challenge there? At the moment, I would say solvents, because um, we are facing real challenges now from legislation, which will stop us using certain... It's very common solvents like toluene, may not be available in the near future. That's going to cause enormous changes in the chemical industry. So, uh, I mean, I, I like change. I think we need change. So, but there's going to be a lot of problems. And um, in the past, when you had legislation that made it difficult to do something in a certain country, what the company would do is they would move the manufacturing somewhere else. India, China, you know, places where the legislation was not so strong. But nowadays, in India and China, the legislation is going up as well. So it's like, so, you know, it's, uh, that's interesting. So that should force change. So. That's very, very nice talk. I appreciate it. What do you think about the carbon energy? It has more than 10 huge impact on the carbon energy put in the place of many metals. Yes, I agree. I agree. Is it easy to choose yeah. to what that yeah, to, to, to improve the resistivity? And I think also. Uh, yeah, uh, in ARC. Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. oh, it's ARC. Yeah, ARC. 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 ARC.
Infatti, ora porto di tossicità di ogni materiale. Well, I, I don't, it's interesting because I, I know there is now, in Europe, for example, there is now a special committee looking at nanoproducts generally because we don't have much information about the toxicity of nanoproducts. I don't know specifically about carbon nanotubes, but yeah. certainly I know that people are now looking very carefully at nano because there are quite a few products on the market now that contain nano, uh, nanometals, for example. Yeah. And nobody really knows what the environmental or toxicity impact is. So there is a lot of work now going on to try and understand that. So I think it's important. But I also recognize the potential for new materials. And I think, you know, I was, um, I was just telling Vanya this morning that I just got some emails today from my friends in Spain in a materials institute. And we are doing some work with them on graphene. Ah, it's incredible, you know, some of the properties, so some of our materials we find if you add a really, really small amount of graphene, you get fantastic changes, you know. Um, so I think there's some really interesting possibilities for new materials to replace traditional. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think the problem is the condensation, not the... Uh, the when the brain contacts with water, the brain... Yeah. The, well, we are blending it. We are, we are making hybrid materials. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I understand. So it might be. We are looking at hybrids. So we are, we are deliberately using only very small amounts of graphene blended into other materials. And maybe that will help the stability. But I, I'm not an expert on graphene, but I think the results I see are very exciting. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I think there's a great potential in this whole area for new materials. New materials which will, you know, mean that we can get the same effect with less material or less energy or something like that, you know, because we need to be more clever, I think, about uh, how we use nature's materials. Yeah. About the discussion super super heater fluids uh, as CO2 or leading to water. But you have to think about the, the energy you have to spend in them yeah. in this process. Yes. Uh, I don't know how much is in when you put in, in well you make the uh, computer computer the how much will you spend the energy? You've got to work it out. You, supercritical CO2, yes, and also the cost, the capex, the investment cost of building a plant yeah. is very high. It only really works either for very large volume like coffee decaffeination or oh, yeah. this kind of thing, or for very high value extracts. So in India, for example, I know a company there and they have something like 20 or 30 medium scale supercritical CO2 extractors where they are extracting very high value products. So I think it only works in certain yes, cases. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's yeah, the energy cost. I think possibly also if you build them where there is a lot of CO2 and a lot of energy, for example, a power station, you know, yeah. a power station's got CO2, it's got low cost electricity, then, then I think it maybe makes more sense. So you need to be careful also about where you put them. When you search of the energy. Yes. Put in like a collaboration of the, the use the energy from water. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is uh, what we sometimes call symbiosis. Yeah, 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 absolutely right, yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering about the waste from sugar. It's to generate energy for the industry. So, if you think about the new costs using this uh, waste, we have to prove that they are more economical than just generating energy. Yeah, I mean, do you have an idea about how can we convince the industry to want to, to burn the, the waste? Like yes. yeah. It's a bit like um, petroleum. Petroleum, of course, originally petroleum was made for energy. And then the chemical industry said, if you give us 10%, we'll give you 50% of the value. And that's the relationship that's made a very successful industry. 
So I think say the same. Okay, you are burning it, you get so much value. If you get the chemicals out, you can get a lot more value. Maybe you take the chemicals and then burn the residue. You know, I think that's worth considering. So I just, uh, you know, trying to persuade power stations or whatever, all these organizations, how do you persuade them that they should make chemicals? And, uh, you know, sometimes it's more easy, sometimes it's more difficult. So, um, but I think it's economic value. That's the way you do it. And therefore, again, you need, you need the market, so you need end users. So we try to work as much as possible with companies who want the product. So we can say, look, if you do this, we have a company there who will buy the product from you. Then it should be, it should be easier. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, companies are very conservative. They don't like change, you know, and we are trying to make them change. So that's, that's a big problem. Yeah, but they also want to make more money as well. <laughs> so, you know, that's, yeah. What the green chemistry suggest about the waste of pesticides? About pesticides? Well, uh, it's a classic, isn't it, environmental sort of social balance. If you don't have pesticides, then the yields for uh, agriculture are lower and therefore more people starve. Um, I think, you know, I suppose uh, the answer would be is be very careful about is the design of the pesticide, the manufacture of the pesticide, the impact of the pesticide on the environment. Pesticides, of course, are applied directly to the environment. And I must admit, I know some pesticide formulations. Uh, for example, talking about solvents again, you know, pesticide formulations are put in solvents. And some of the solvents they use are not green. So, you know, I think we should look at the formulation. We should be very careful about what goes into the formulation. We want products which are very quickly biodegradable. I don't think we should avoid pesticides because otherwise we, it doesn't make sense. The social costs will be far too high. But I think the design of pesticides could be improved. Is there some methods to absorb the pesticides? Yeah, I mean, certainly some of the porous solids that you could actually put into the, into the soil to allow capture, that is certainly possible. Um, there's, there's people working in these areas. I'm not sure how much progress they're making, but um, I, know, I think the biggest change that will happen soon will be in the formulation because there are some components in the formulation that will be banned by legislation. So they will have to change. I mean, I was, when I was in South Africa, they were telling me about, uh, I was asking, of course, about oranges, and they were saying, they were telling me the pesticides they use to spray the oranges. And they were like, what? I mean, these, these molecules are banned in Europe and the US, but they're still using them in South Africa. You know, we need to stop that. You know, there's got to be much more global agreements about what is acceptable. Um, so, there's a lot of things to tackle there, but the formulation, I think, is going to have to change for many of these, certainly for, for Europe and uh, North America, I think, and hopefully more than that. Yeah, big challenging area.